They can do Vortex on that shit. <laughs> I've seen them ankle ones and I was like, dude, even that. But if you go with the, the oh it is, oh yeah, it is. Um the other the other thing too is if you go with the, the python and worry about water. No. Yeah, you can get gators. Have you seen gators? Everyone else. They like come over, they go over. So they got strap that stays underneath the car. Yeah. You pull them up and they zip up and then for the water. I'll figure it out. You can probably walk across like I mean a creek up to your knee and probably won't get your pantlers wet on it. That would be an idea, like for fishing. Anything if you're hiking and you run into water, you expect to run into water. Yeah. I think I'd mostly run like Yeah, because I don't find a whole lot anymore. Honestly, dude, I would stay away from the board. I would get like one, like I have one perfect food, and they're great for like winter. It is. And like wet shoes. Like if I, if I was doing like dry stuff, I would get the same Solomon without the Gore-Tex. That way your foot is dry. Mm. Yeah, they don't breathe. They don't breathe at all. So once you get the inside of that Gore-Tex foot, you're going to be pretty much walking with like a wet back. It doesn't. Gore-Tex is hard to dry if your foot's in it for sure. I got that Gore-Tex jacket. Nice. And I actually got snow up there, there's mm-hmm. one the whole day. Yeah. <laughs> Once you get some good. That's what I want the, the hikers to probably do enough. Just their normal hiking shoe. Um, Gore-Tex is wet, you know what I mean? You just don't want to be walking sweaty feet. You have a Gore-Tex backpack? No, I won't run a Vortex backpack either though. I'll, I'll just run one through bags and then uh, I guess we'll do it. Is it a sham pack on? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just do that. I don't, yeah, the bag is part of the bag. You're never going to find a completely waterproof backpack. Yeah. Technically, they don't. It's at least a comfy chair here for me. <laughs> All right, then, I like this. Also, you should leave that crap in the corner and shit. I rented in that store that you have up there in Joe Creek. Yeah. It's okay. It's just it's so loud to move. I feel like it's so obnoxious. That stool? Yeah. I wore sandals a couple times last semester. And like when we had a couple classes that were like right in a row, and I would stand there for like two hours or whatever. At the end, I was like, man, this is not, not super comfortable. <laughs> Wish there was some sitting I could do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
you want to get yeah, it finished with one. Yeah, I think have one more year left. And then, well, two years. So yeah, one year. So like, when we're done with this semester, one more. Two years left? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So like, I'm going to get there in that two years. How long will you be doing this semester? Uh, I think it's a four year. Well, you've been in the a couple of years before. Yeah. You know, Anybody need me to do their attendance? <laughs> you probably need to wait 60 seconds because it's still technically 12.59. <laughs> well, and it, if you send me an email and say, hey, I was in class and I forgot to, like, I can do it. It just, this seems like a really good way to stop the issues with I'm forgetting. Yeah. I, and I understand, but like, I just know that there's going to be time where I'm going to forget. And I'll try to make a reminder announcement at the beginning of each class because I normally would have taken attendance so I can say, hey, do your attendance. But yeah. Okay, attendance should be open. Can you sign me in? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Anyone else need me to do theirs? They're working okay. Okay. Awesome. We got everybody. Yeah. So for this class, um, pretty much the structure is going to be that on Monday and Wednesday, we're going to introduce some theory and we're going to have more of a traditional lecture in that 50 minute section. And then Friday morning, we'll be doing a lot of application exercises frequently in a group. And so while you absolutely can say, hey, I'm on Zoom, have whoever is in my group that I'm assigned to pull up Zoom on their laptop too, and like you can still participate, I just think it will be significantly easier and more productive for you if you're in that team environment here in class. Um, there are a couple random Mondays and Wednesdays where we have some exercises too, um, but they're just easier to do as individuals. So if you are online and you want to do it, you can do it by yourself, whereas the class, I'll kind of let you guys choose if you want to do it solo or together when you're in class. But you'll also be able to see when we're doing that because they're posted, right? So this week we're going to do this uh, roller coaster crash analysis on Friday. And so we're going to watch this video and we're going to talk a little bit about error likely situations. And then you guys in a group, a couple groups, a large group, it's your choice, are going to get together and you're going to answer these questions, look through the materials we've presented today and Wednesday and Friday morning and put together a submission. Um, some of the submissions you have, you know, a couple days to work on them. Some of them, it's what you do in class. That's what you submit. I try to put in the title, um, when it's an in-class thing. So those exercises, um, those are going to be in class. And then like comparison here, 
There's the safety culture and social norms in reactor control rooms. It's not an application exercise. So this is something we're not going to do in class. You guys will be responsible for. But we'll talk about each assignment as they come up. But that's kind of how I tried to indicate to you we're going to do this in class. Don't worry about starting it, even if it's due that day and we haven't started it, like it's just what you do in class versus things that you'll be working on outside of class. Does that, does that make sense? I tried to key them for you, right? So the self-assessment, we won't do that one in class, but it's also due on a Sunday, right? So it's not during a class day, you have time to work on it. Um, most of these are due a class day because they're due in class. So that kind of is your key to figuring out, do I need to be working on this or can I just wait and we're going to cover it in class? Okay, let's talk about the syllabus real quick. And let me share the screen for those online. Okay, online, can you guys see that syllabus? Yep. Yep. Okay. okay, so we're in this classroom um, pretty consistently, even when we do our lab days, we'll pretty much use this classroom. Um, there might be one or two that we go use the simulator. I was supposed to get um, some more training over the winter break, and then just due to COVID, um, the people who were supposed to do that kept getting sick. So I wasn't able to, and I, I need either a teaching assistant to get good at helping me run that, or I need to be able to run it. So we stopped having some of the issues that we were having during the lab for con ops with that simulator. Because I don't want us to spend a lot of time hoping the simulator is working. I want us to be doing stuff. So there's a nuclear engineering student who their um, CPI advisor had to um, go off campus. So they moved them over to working with me. So we'll see if that student is pretty competent at the simulator. We might get some cool exercises. And if not, we'll just do simulated stuff here in the classroom. And I'll kind of keep you guys up to date. But I know I was getting frustrated with the simulator. I'm sure you guys were getting frustrated with the simulator. And they weren't able to give me that training. Um, and so I'm having to still figure out some stuff. So we'll play that by ear. But it's going to be in this classroom. Um, the big focus of this class is an examination of case studies from the nuclear power industry and possibly from other industries. We're pretty much not going to pull from other industries uh, in any real major factor. We are going to look at that roller coaster one because it's, I think, super relevant and interesting. But it's almost all going to be in the nuclear industry. The individual case, or sorry, the group case studies you guys are going to have to do are the biggest part of your grade. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the real focus is looking at the accidents that have occurred, preventing some theory about human performance, human performance enhancement, error likely situations, some of that safety culture we've discussed in ConOps, tools from ConOps, like our three way communication, and how those things could have prevented or mitigated these accidents that have occurred and why we do things the way we do as we learn from these accidents. So it's a little, little bit of history of the nuclear industry. I think it's a really fun class. I think it's really fun topics we go over. Um, and then we're gonna practice in some of our exercises using those tools and talking about how we would use them in the workplace um, so we can really learn from these past accidents. Um, same statement I've said over the last couple classes we went over the syllabus with disabilities. If you think you might have one, um, like especially if you take some medicine that, that makes it harder for you to focus and like you're fine now, but maybe we'll have an issue when it comes to a test. Work with disability services now, and if that issue comes up, I'm clear to give you an accommodation. I can't just make exceptions for students, right, because that's not fair to everyone. So work with disability students if you have an issue, uh, disability services if you have an issue. Code of Ethics and Academic Dishonesty, you guys will be writing papers and submitting written answers to a lot of things in this class. So just make sure you're citing sources. Um, 
like I said, I got the feedback that sometimes my assignments were a little bit vague. So I've tried really hard this semester to be much more specific. Tell you how many pages I'm looking for, what exactly I'm looking for in answers, especially for the written assignments where I'm asking you to explain. Um, I'm making sure to tell you when I want you to reference specific things we've been discussing in, top, in class and make sure you're reporting those definitions and those terms over into your answers. Um, so I've tried to be a lot more detailed. If you guys have questions on assignments, please feel free to ask me, send me an email, stop by my office, um, and I'll clarify anything. Same electronic device policy as all my classes. Okay, here's our course setup. We're going to talk about first events and errors, and then we're going to analyze a non-nuclear event, and we're going to have a quiz on error-likely situations, which is going to be um, from the DOE handbook reading. We're going to talk about unsafe attitudes, at-risk, uh, unsafe behaviors, at-risk attitudes. We're going to have an exercise. We're going to talk about human performance enhancement. So for that, there's going to be a human performance improvement tool demonstration where you guys are going to have to look at some of these human improvement tools and you're going to have to get together with a partner and you're going to actually demonstrate to the class how we use that tool in a simulated scenario um, and then we're going to talk about the Bainberry accident which was a nuclear weapons test that detonated not as they intended uh, not underground as it was supposed to and contaminated a huge portion of the Nevada test site and Las Vegas. And then the wind blew it up all the way through uh, Utah and parts of Idaho. So we're gonna talk about that accident. We're gonna talk about safety culture and we're gonna talk about required attitudes. There's a culture and leadership quiz that comes from that reading. Um, we're also gonna talk about some chapters in that black and yellow Mizumi book. Um, so there's some reading and then some discussion groups that we'll have in class especially when we talk about human performance and safety culture. Safety controls and defense in depth. So this is looking at the physical systems that help us prevent and mitigate accidents. And then we're going to start our case study. We're going to talk about the Cimarron plan and we're going to um, watch the movie that they made about this accident. It is from the 80s and it is great. It's a great movie. Uh, then we're going to talk about some criticality accidents. There's a, a, we're going to watch Fat Man and Little Boy, uh, which dramatizes one of the accidents. And we've got reading for these. And so one of the things we will be discussing is comparing what Hollywood got wrong. Um, so do look forward to watching the movies. I think that they make it look much more real. But make sure you guys are doing the reading because the movies are not all technically correct. Then we're going to start talking about our book studies. So this SL1 case study, how many of you guys got the Idaho Falls book as your book that you chose? Um, was it Patel? I got all four. You got all four, okay. Excited about accidents. Katie? Yeah. Did you raise your hand? And Haley? Or no, Jennifer. Anyone online, did you guys choose the Idaho Falls book as your? I did. Who said I did? Sorry, it didn't tell me. Yeah. Okay, great. And Marcus, you got them all. Okay. And Patel and Marcus, you guys are excited. I like it. Okay, and Marcus. All right, so we will be discussing that one first. So for those of you who chose that book, you're going to have a, a little report basically to write up on it. And then you will be required to contribute during the discussion, uh, some of the answers to the questions. And that'll be the case for each book, right? But so, you know, Jennifer, you have the Idaho Falls book, so you'll be responsible for having that report for the case study three, but you won't be responsible for doing the same thing for case study four and five. Does that make sense? Okay. So, then we'll be talking about Chernobyl. So how many of you guys got the Chernobyl book? Haley, Joe? I think I did too as well. I'm not sure. I got a citation. 
Um, do you remember what color the cover of your book was, Kyle? No, my wife wanted to know that. I told her to pick one. Because I couldn't decide. <laughs> Okay. Okay, and then how many of you picked one of the two Fukushima books? One it? Okay. Then what I am going to do is since Marcus and Patel got all of them, and Lynette is in a group by herself right now, I'm gonna assign Marcus and Cattell to case study five. And so you guys can read them all, but the ones you'll be graded on is going to be the Fukushima. Is that okay for you to tell? Does that work for you, Marcus? Okay. Okay, great. Awesome. That worked out better than I was expecting. I was hoping that everyone bought the same book. So good. We've got a good split of three or four people in each group. Um, Porter, which book did you get? Um, no book. No book? Okay. You can choose any one of them then. And if you go to ISU's bookstore website, you can do a search and it'll list all the ISBNs for the books. They're all listed as recommended. And so then you can just pick the one you want. Sam, which one did you get? If you're speaking, Sam, I can't hear you. You have them all. Okay. Um, then really you can, yeah, pick whichever one you want to be in. Because right now there's three in every group. So Porter, do you know which one you would prefer to do? Um, I, I'll do the Chernobyl. Chernobyl, okay. So then Sam, would you like to do SL1 or Fukushima? And I will um, just, I'll email this out after class so you guys who got multiple books know which case study you'll actually be graded for. And then we're going to do some individual accident presentations. So an accident that is not one of the ones we covered, you guys are going to pick and present on that. And then we're going to be doing some practical uh, finals. And so what this will be is, is will be again, you guys demonstrating some of that human performance improvement skills um, and talking about how um, some of those skills could have prevented some of these accidents and why we're going to use them in the workplace to avoid having these occur again. Um, grading, 10% attendance, 10% those Moodle assignments and quizzes. And then your case study report and your midterm um, are each 30%. And then the final is not in there. Let's see why. Okay. I will update the syllabus because it doesn't have the practical final. But the lab reports and the case studies and the practical exams will be much more the grade than any of the uh, quizzes or written type stuff. So this is a much more practical class and that's what counts towards more the grade. I'll get that fixed and uploaded to Moodle. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. I apologize. And uh, again, this is a, the standard ISU grading scheme is what we'll use. Any questions on the syllabus? Okay. Let's jump into talking about event anatomy. Maybe. Okay. 
So we're going to go through this anatomy of events. And as we kind of dissect how an event progresses, keep in mind this terminology and this analysis as we then go look at all of the different events that we're going to. Um, how many of you guys remember when we talked in CONOPS about our ORPS reporting, what the actual definition of an event is? Remember the definition. It's something out of the ordinary, but it doesn't cause a problem. Okay. Anybody online remember? Okay, so your definition there, Joe, that was actually our definition, pretty close to our definition for occurrence. Right? So something out of the ordinary, but we didn't cause a significant issue. An event is really anything that happens. So it can include accidents where we do actually have a negative outcome or occurrences where something out of the norm, norm happens, but we don't have a significant negative consequence, not an accident or a near miss. Uh, near misses can be events too, where nothing actually happened, but only because we got lucky. The things that should have prevented it from happening were inadequate or not in place. And it just so happens that we got lucky that things didn't progress, right? So event is really anything that happens. And so when we talk in this class about events, incidents, accidents, and occurrences, they actually all have specific meanings. And that event is all of them. An incident is something negative that occurs, but we don't meet enough consequences to be an accident. Accidents are major. And so some of the uh, things we'll talk about where nobody was hurt, a major equipment was not hurt, those are gonna be incidents. So Bainberry, even though we released a tremendous amount of radiation into the environment, we didn't hurt anybody. It's usually called an incident by people in the industry. Even though a lot of the papers that I'll show you say accident, that's because the media calls everything an accident. They don't use the technical definitions. Occurrences, um, a lot of what we're going to see in the Silkwood movie about the Cimarron plant in Kansas are occurrences. We had an individual get contaminated. We had an individual not respond to an alarm. Those aren't accidents. Something negative did happen. We violated something, right? So we're getting into ORPS reporting if they were complying, which I'll let you judge after watching the movie if you think they ever complied with anything. Um, and so we'll, we'll have different degrees, but all of those accidents, incidents, occurrences, near miss are types of events, and they're gonna progress through the same series. Okay. So there are a combination of several things that have to occur to allow an event to happen, right? And it's in this big circle because they're all connected, right? So our event is here in the, in the center. And a lot of times the easiest thing to say cause that event is this initiating action. This is going to be what we typically refer to as our cause. Of the accident. Um, after an accident occurs, there's an investigation that's required. Sometimes for an incident and an occurrence as well, it's usually a good idea for a near miss, but always happens after an accident. And it's called a root cause analysis. And there's an entire field called hazard analysis um, that people who are mathematicians, statisticians, engineers, and um, some operators can go into. If you like, if you guys took statistics, have any of you guys taken statistics? You're taking it this semester. If you happen to really like statistics, you might be somebody who really likes hazard analysis and safety document creation because it's all very statistically based. And you're going to look at from this event, this root cause analysis is going to determine what is the thing that occurred that made the accident happen? 
But it's very, very rarely as easy as saying, you know, uh, for Chernobyl, like, for example, the operator hit the scram button and that's what actually caused the accident. Well, there was a whole lot that happened leading up to that operator pressing scram, right? There were latent organizational weaknesses. And as we talk about Chernobyl, we'll look at some of the differences between Soviet and that community-based communist fed attitude that it was present in their technical structure and how it leads to very different sets of problems than here in the United States where we're a very independent culture and we value that. We have different organizational latent weaknesses usually than the Soviets did. And so the way our accidents progressed and where they came from, the ones that happened in the U.S. almost certainly would not happen in the USSR. The ones that happened in the USSR probably wouldn't have happened in the U.S. But we still, both countries had major accidents, right? So you have different latent organizational weaknesses depending on the mission, goals, policies, processes, and programs that your organization puts in place, right? In the United States, we have now really developed a good safety culture program at almost all of our nuclear installations, right? We talk about how important it is. One of the things that's happening right now, and I know that Christy is going to talk to you guys, or sorry, the 153 class about in the career class, is emotional intelligence or EQ. Have you guys heard that in any of your classes? Okay. An emotionally intelligent person is someone who can deal with all of the emotions and attitudes in their team work environment in a very methodical and technical approach, just like we deal with all the technical factors in our work environment, right? With our regular IQ components, right? And so how you deal with these late organizational weaknesses, all of these missions and goals, our safety culture, our human performance improvement programs, our OSHA requirements, our regulatory requirements. This is going to feed into that initiating action, right? So are our error precursors. We've talked about the fact that everybody makes errors, right? It's a known thing. The goal in the nuclear industry, on one hand, is to reduce errors. And you're going to have a lot of pressure as an operator to operate free from errors. But we also want to mitigate the fact that we know inevitably errors are going to happen. I think that we mentioned this briefly in ConOps. So have you guys heard of the Swiss cheese model for accidents? A little bit? Okay. So if I have a slice of Swiss cheese, what's it going to look like? It's going to hold up the whole thing, right? So here's my slice of Swiss cheese full of holes. If I put another slice of Swiss cheese over the top of this, right? So we're going to imagine that this gets placed on top of that. And it has a slightly different pattern. If I made an error that was not protected against, that went through this hole, what would happen? I'm talking this, right? Now if I put this other piece of cheese up there, I can make all of the errors in this hole, but only part of this hole overlaps with this one. So now if I make an error down here, I'm going to hit this piece of cheese. There's now a barrier, right? So the error is known, and there's now a barrier. So I have to make a smaller amount of errors for this to overlap with this, right? And as you put in more and more layers of cheese, the likelihood that any of your errors that can find a hole, being able to find the hole that goes all the way through to an event becomes less and less, right? <clears throat> One of the ways that we close those holes on the Swiss cheese model is that we use controls. 
So probably the accidents we're going to analyze in this class, do you think will identify quad controls as one of their root causes? Zero. Do you think zero? Why? Okay. Okay. Joe? You mean controls as in knobs and switches or just procedures? Both. Both are considered controls. Your physical barriers and your process controls, such as procedures. What about law and line? What do you guys think? We have an answer from Sam of all of them. We have the two opposites, none of them and all of them. It's a lot closer to all of them. Because you guys are going to be highly trained. Right after you get out of this program, those of you who want to be control room operators, the first year of your career is pretty much on the job training. So in addition to this degree, you're going to go and spend a year being very, very precisely taught how to use those controls and what they do in that specific facility where you get hired. And those of you who don't want to be control room operators, you're still probably going to spend six to eight months being very specifically um, on the job train for your auxiliary position and learning that system, right? It's going to be assumed that that training reduces a lot of your likelihood to make errors. And you have a standard that you will be held to where you don't make the same errors for sure, right? If you make the same error over and over, and it's going to be really hard for you to be successful as an operator, right? You have to learn from your mistakes. And as you get trained more and more completely, they're going to want to see less and less errors overall. But even a perfectly designed system, the variable of all the different people who can use it, it can be interpreted very differently, right? Um, Flawed controls, especially as we look at historical accidents, before safety culture came in and tried to standardize a lot of things, this is a huge contributor. We do a lot better now. A lot fewer modern accidents say that flawed controls are a major factor. We also teach operators to give feedback when they find that a control is inadequate. When you're trained over something, if you have trouble understanding how to use it, your mentor's job is going to be to give feedback that says, hey, this new person brought in a new perspective and had a new problem. We need to address this, right? So our programs and policies have really helped. So I think um, if you looked at Haley accidents after the 90s, I would agree with you. You're going to see almost none of them saying flawed controls are the issue. Prior to that, a lot of those accidents, as we were developing safety culture, it was a lot of flawed controls that were allowed to exist because we were weak on our organization. And then when we made an error, our flawed controls made it worse instead of better. And then we got some initiating accidents that got us to target. Okay. DOE handbook definition of event. Unwanted, undesirable change in a state of a facility structure, system, component, or human organizational component that exceeds established significant criteria. So what's really important here, unwanted and undesirable change. If you did not predict that that system could get to that condition, right? So then it's an undesirable change or unwanted change. That's technically an event. Even if it doesn't cause any accident, if that unwanted undesirable change establishes, exceeds established significance criteria, we have an event. So unwanted and undesirable. The other important part is that it exceeds established significant criteria. For the nuclear industry, typically, we start defining accidents when we exceed a certain percent of full power, when we exceed a certain temperature, 
when we exceed a certain radiological release into the environment or to a worker, and if we damage a certain amount of the system. Those are our, our big significant criteria. And usually there will be a couple of different stages. And if you hit the maximum on one, but you only got the minimum on one, it'll be a certain event category. If you get the maximum on two of them, that'll be a different significant category and so on and so forth as we rate our accidents. We have an uh, international nuclear incident scale that will rate accidents using an international standard based on the consequences. And we'll be looking up the INIS rating for each of the accidents we study. You guys kind of get used to that. But we're looking at an established significant criteria. Nuclear facilities want to prevent certain high risk events, mediate the consequences to most events, and learn from any events that do occur. It is not possible in the nuclear industry, in life in general, to remove all risk, right? There is always risk in living. Risk in driving your car, risk in operating a nuclear reactor. When there is a high enough risk, we're going to need to take steps to prevent that event from happening or reduce the consequences, right? There is a significant risk when you drive a car that you'll be in a crash. About a third of all drivers do, right? Some of those risks or those accidents can be high enough risk that they may be fatal. So we put seatbelts in cars and we require you to use them when you operate your vehicle, right? We said there's a risk. Here's our mitigation because it's a high enough risk and it happens often enough. Do you guys think we would be required to wear seatbelts if fatal accidents only occurred one in 10,000 drivers? I don't know. Maybe not. It happens way more often, so we are. Same is true in the nuclear industry. We don't have meltdowns all that often. We are going to discuss almost every nuclear reactor meltdown that has occurred, and it's just a few. But the consequences when that happens are so significant. Facilities are destroyed, there's loss of life, there are major environmental issues that we still say as an industry, we want to prevent this accident. We want to prevent the conditions that lead to a meltdown, right? So that significant here, this is a high risk event. So we're going to work really hard to prevent it. Some smaller events, we're not going to worry about preventing it. We know what's going to happen. So we're going to mediate the consequences so it doesn't become a high risk event. Okay, this is where we're going to start talking about defense in depth a little later in the semester. We know that you're going to make errors as an operator. So we're not going to allow any single control that you have as an operator be capable of exceeding our temperature, right? You have to make two independent changes, preferably with two different operators, to get to those conditions, right? So now we said we know what's going to happen. We're going to mediate the consequences of it happening rather than just prevent it from happening. You can't. It's too high frequency. An initiating action is an action by an individual, either correct, in error, or in violation, which we'll talk about the difference between error and violation, that results in a facility event. Okay? Violation is deliberate and intentional. This is very rarely something that occurs in the nuclear industry unless it happens out of ignorance. You um, deliberately will and intentionally act. Uh, this will sometimes happen with people who have an expertise, such as an electrician or a welder but they have a background in a non-nuclear industry. And so they have not been taught the significance of procedure adherence in a, in a different industry, right? So then they come over and it's what is considered normal to them. So they know that they are violating something, but they don't think of it as, as, as significant as it would be to somebody who has a background in the nuclear industry, right? So 
Violation is deliberate and intentional. An error is unintentional. Okay? You have what you're expected to do, and you don't do the right thing, but you weren't intending to deviate from any procedure or expectation, right? This still upon. Errors can either be active or passive. Active errors are immediately observable, undesirable outcomes. Do you guys know what active omission and active commission is? You guys have heard the phrase lie of omission, right? That's when you leave something out. You didn't actively lie, you didn't say something that you needed to. Errors. You can not do the right thing, or you can do something extra that wasn't right. Same thing. So sometimes the mistake you make is not acting when you need it to. And that to me is the most stressful part of being an operator <laughs> because there's always something you're supposed to do. Sometimes it might be doing nothing, but choosing to do nothing when you were supposed to do something is just as bad as doing the wrong thing or not doing something when you need to. Like, Choosing not to act can be just as bad as acting the wrong way. Um, the vast majority of initiating actions are active errors. Where you did something and you immediately observed an undesirable outcome because the action that that operator took. And that's pretty good on initiating action. Okay? So you're going to see that the strategic approach that's used is anticipating and preventing active errors. We'll talk a little bit about preventing, preventing violations, but the biggest thing for preventing violations is you don't hire people who won't buy into safety culture. Right? That prevents this attitude. So then you have the people who don't mean to. It's really, really hard to detect a passive error. A passive error is going to have a delayed, unobservable, undesirable effect. So you made a mistake three days ago by not filling out a log book and nobody noticed it. And then people make an error that is active, maybe an uh, omission because they didn't have the correct information in their log sheet. Now your passive error has been discovered, right? It happened, but if this person had made sure that his paperwork was double checked, the passive error wouldn't have had the effect it did, right? So we target preventing and detecting active errors. Okay, this definition, it's pretty much follows. Error precursors, right? Unfavorable prior condition that increase the probability for an error. When you are in an error likely situation, you're in a situation where it's very easy to increase the probability of an error in a specific situation, right? So error likely situations would be doing really any highly specific task where it's easy to make a mistake. Error precursors are what make it more likely you'll make an error in those error likely situations. Okay? One of the big things that safety culture tries to do, and we'll look at these accident analysis, is we try to look at human nature and we try to work in a way that does not aggravate those limits. Um, do you guys all remember when we did the multitasking activity? You guys had to scream your name and when you had to write it down on a sheet of paper and the individual writing got very flustered by everyone screaming their name. Remember that activity? Okay. Humans are not good at multitasking. Even humans who say they're good at it, the studies show that we're not as good as we think we are. So we're going to limit multitasking. And in fact, for operators, the general rule is you don't multitask. So we're going to take away that ability to create an error precursor by having you do two or three things at once and say, focus on this one thing and do it right. Right? So that's how we're going to look at error precursors 
in the reading, in the viewing handbook, in several other sources, error likely situations are often called error traps. I prefer this word because an error likely situation makes it sound like, well, it just, it's a situation that exists and this one's more error likely than another. An error trap to me always makes me think of the fact that that situation is trying to trap me into making an error. So I need to take specific steps to avoid falling in that trap. So I personally prefer the statement error trap. What's the idea? Defense in depth. Okay. So error precursors, things that are going to increase our likelihood of falling into an error trap. Time pressure, organizational weaknesses, flawed control, like we talked about leading up to an accident, right? An event. Inadequate operator proficiency. You're not trained well. You're not going to avoid errors. Lack of communication. Not using that appropriate formal communication. What are some other error precursors you guys can think of? Fitness for duty. Okay. That can include tired, hungover, emotionally distraught because of something that's happening at home, right? Hostile work, Hostile work environment, absolutely. What about online? You guys suggest an error precursor that we haven't covered yet? Workplace cleanliness. Cleanliness, yep, and housekeeping. Absolutely. It is 100% a precursor to tripping to have a cord on the ground. Did you mention the not fit to work? We did cover fitness for duty. You probably couldn't hear Joe mention that one. I bet this owl is really quiet. Okay, your assigned reading in the Dewey handbook covers a very complete list of error precursors. So be looking for the additional ones in that reading and on the quiz. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about a few of these error precursors. Flawed controls. Pretty much whenever controls are an issue during an event, you will find that there was either a flaw with the existing controls or appropriate controls were not in place. Okay. Controls are used to create defensive measures that protect facility equipment and people. So when you have a flawed control, you have a defect that inhibits that ability. And it's going to fail to prevent the occurrence of an active error. So when we're talking about controls, we're really looking at what that active error could be and how we could prevent that from harming our system or our people. Sometimes it's because we didn't think about the accident that could happen if X, Y, and Z happened together. That's a big part of accident analysis. Sometimes it's because the controls did something we didn't expect. Um, when we get to talking about Chernobyl, one of the things that they did is they took their control rods, which are a control used to shut down the reactor, and they tipped them with graphite. So when you first inserted your control rods, instead of shutting down the reaction, they increased it for just a little tiny bit. But it was enough for that reactor to go completely out of control, right? So we took an existing control and we modified it and it was no longer the appropriate control. Okay. Hidden deficiency 
policies and management, control processes or values that create workplace condition that provoke errors or degrade the integrity of controls. In uh, the incidents that led up to Fukushima, we're going to read about some of the um, bulletins that went out letting the Japanese nuclear agency know that there was a problem in the assumptions for their safety analysis for the height of the walls they needed to protect against certain types of flood and tsunami damage. Some plants owned by a different operating company changed their seawalls. And in areas where a higher tsunami wall hit, you had plants that were not destroyed. TEPCO at Fukushima Daiichi, which is the plant that was actually affected, ignored those statements and they didn't change their seawall. And so a smaller part of the tsunami that hit the island caused more damage at their plant. That was 100% a management deficiency. And I think personally, the most significant issue with Fukushima's accident was management deficiency. Human performance. Okay, so we've talked about this concept all throughout the program. People are fallible, even the best make mistakes. So error is going to happen and no amount of counseling, counseling training or motivation can alter that, right? Um, my father was a, was a Marine and uh, he always, you know, the, to err is human. It's true, right? There's a, a saying, I guess they have in the Marines, to err is human, to forgive is divine, and neither is Marine Corps policy, which just amuses me because he's definitely a hard ass. <laughs> but even with that attitude, the Marines still make mistakes, right? Everyone does. So high-risk industries like nuclear codify a human error management process through human performance improvement. And we're going to spend a lot of time reading about human performance improvement and the specific techniques. We introduced a bunch of them in our CONOP class. We're going to go into more detail in this class. Okay, I'm not going to read this to you guys because this is very, very much from the DOE handbook reading that's assigned. Um, but if you are curious about what I consider to be the important definitions to pull out from that reading, they're on this slide. Okay. Even though we know people are going to make mistakes and we're going to accept that, the level of safety and reliability of a facility is still directly dependent on the behavior of people. So even though we know we're going to make errors, we're going to put a lot of controls in the fact in place to handle those errors. We as operators, the managers at a facility, the engineers, the rad techs, all of the people at a facility their behavior is going to directly affect facility safety. And that's why it's so important that we learn about human performance improvement and human performance enhancement and safety culture and learn these skills. Okay. The big reason that we study these accidents is by understanding the reasons mistakes occur and the applications the lesson learned from these events, we can improve improve our current human performance and prevent ourselves from having the same accident and the same event repeated. Okay. Um, the DOE anticipates so that we can prevent, catch, and recover from active errors. And then we identify and eliminate human organizational weaknesses that provoke human error. NRC has a very similar process. Any questions on that overview? Do you okay. You're welcome. Any questions online? OK, 
Okay. Nope, I'm good. All right, awesome. Well, that's the end of classes for your first day back. Hope everybody is excited about this semester. Um, I have an office hour for the next hour if you guys have any questions or need anything. And otherwise, I will see you tomorrow for what's our class tomorrow? Yeah, reactor theory. Yeah. And since I don't know what your guys' other classes schedules are, but I kind of figured most of you would probably not want to commute onto campus at 8 a.m. if that's your only class you got to be here for. So feel free to be on Zoom. And I'll see you guys bright and early. Yeah. Fair what? Fair Island. Island? Yeah. Blue yes, I do. Yes, I'll bring some tomorrow. How many? Uh, so I have 16. I mean, I'm trying to finish the blue. understand the syllabus and the reading what okay show me what i'm supposed to read for that events okay